Uh, now what I'd like to do is uh, slide into the, uh, the airstrip show. And uh, we went up to Forest Lake, and they had a fly-in up there and a car show. So uh, if we could uh, get the first video of, of some of that. at the Daniel Del Pipani Airport, August 20th, and hundreds were on hand to see the planes, the classic car, and the boat show, and dine in the Florence Lake Lions Club, and listen to the big band music of the BBB Orchestra. Today we're at the Forest Lake Air Show and I'm talking with the uh, John Schmidt, who is the secretary of the Forest Lake Airport. How are you doing, John? I'm well. Thank you for coming out to the airport today. Thank you. Well, well we want to find out about a little bit about the, uh, the EAA program. Could you explain what it is and what it does? EAA is a national organization based in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. You can find it at eaa.org. It's a bunch of people who get together and uh, promote aviation. Uh, some even choose to build their own airplane. One thing that EAA saw was a need for new young pilots to be part of, of the aviation community. So to try and do that, they started off a program called Young Eagles. Um, there's EAA chapters all over the United States, groups of pilots who, who promote aviation, who build their own airplane, and who fly Young Eagles. What is a Young Eagle? It's a kid between ages 8 and 17 who wants to go for an airplane ride. The ride is free. It's usually a brief ride because it is costing the pilot some money. He's donating his time, he's donating his airplane. But it's a great way to get introduced to aviation. And so you go up for a Young Eagles ride with a pilot and you get a little certificate at the end. And uh, there's more steps to the program after that. You can cho choose to educate yourself more on aviation and uh, just involve yourself in aviation in any way, uh, whether becoming a pilot or becoming a mechanic or an air traffic controller or just a promoter of aviation. Well, this sounds like an excellent opportunity for some young people to experience some career exploration so they can get an idea of, of some of the careers and possibilities that are out there. And again, it, it, any, it's kind of like the Boy Scouts or any other positive organization that's focusing on positive behavior and developing citizenship in young people and I think that's very important. Now how many years have you flown and what's your experience? Um, I've been a private pilot for 20 years. I started getting involved in aviation. I was not a pilot at all. I was a newbie and, and people welcomed me in and I kept asking questions. Um, I've flown 170 Young Eagles in my lifetime already. Um, I own uh, three or four airplanes. Uh, one I'm still working on. I'm actually building an airplane. I own a hangar at uh, New Richmond, Wisconsin, and I'm building a hangar here at Forest Lake. Okay, well, very good. So you have, how many, how many years you've been flying then? I've been flying for 20 years. I, uh, actually, I wanted, to, I wanted to get my pilot's license before the 4th of July, and I worked and worked and worked for it, and I got it on the 6th of July. I just <laughs> missed it one year, because I wanted to fly at night and observe the fireworks from the sky, you know, and fly around in circles and watch the fireworks from, from above and I missed it by two days, so I had to wait for 363 days to get that opportunity to do that the following year. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce the, that gentleman, John Schmidt, uh, and bring him on the program. And uh, uh, we saw the interview when it was nice and warm outside. It happens to be snowing today, but that, that was great. Uh, and you've been flying for 20 years, and you, you seem to have quite a vast experience in the field of aviation. Uh, and, uh, do you have anything to add? Well, uh, thank you very much for that interview and that tape. Um, you're showing my good side, which is, of course, covered by the shade of my hat, so <laughs> the audience was spared my face. Um, yeah, it, the Young Eagles program is very important to me, and, and teaching kids about aviation is very important to me. Uh, Young Eagles now has, has flown. If you go to youngeagles.org on the Internet, you can, you can get a lot of resources there, and uh, you'll see that there's a counter on that website that has flown uh, 1.6 million kids so far since the program began in 1992. Uh, the original goal was to fly a million kids and, and everybody said that would be impossible. There's no way you can give a million kids a free ride in an airplane in 10 years. 
and uh, they put the deadline of December 17th, 2003 on that, uh, on that million kid mark. And the reason they did that was the 100th anniversary of flight, the Wright Brothers flight, was December 17th, 2003. They, the Wright Brothers first flew uh, in December of, of 1903. At Kitty Hawk, I believe. At Kitty Hawk. And uh, everybody said it would be impossible. And, and the one millionth kid was from Ohio, and he was flown in October. They beat the deadline by <laughs> two months. All right. So they, they have a total of over uh, 1.6 million right now. Okay. Uh, did you have something on the intro to aviation class that you're teaching? Did you have a a few shots in your laptop with that? Um, actually, yes, we have a laptop right here, and I uh, did bring along some, uh, some uh, photos of my intro to aviation class. I teach an intro to aviation class. I do it every summer. Uh, it's fairly popular. There's a waiting list to it right now. Uh, here's some shots that you can see of uh, kids getting a tour of Anoka County Airport. Those are uh, the con tower. That's actually a control tower. Kids are up there. They're watching airplanes land. They're uh, seeing the equipment that the, uh, the uh, air traffic controllers work with. Um, I, I teach this class. It's about 30 kids. It's three weeks. It's about four hours a day. Uh, here we are at Daryl Bulldog's engine shop at Anoka County Airport. And you see the gentleman there is a mechanic. He's holding up an engine part, and you can kind of see a green glow off of it. It's called magnafluxing. What happens is they put a chemical on the metal part, and then they put it under this light and they can see if there's any cracks there because the chemical will flow toward the crack. This is how they check for microscopic cracks that are not available to the human eye. Um, of course, Huge kids, safety issue. Huge. huge safety issue. These engines run. Uh, here's engine parts that most pilots don't even get to see. These are engines being overhauled and uh, being refurbished, uh, ready to go back into uh, aircraft. There's Daryl Bulldock on the left. Here's kids probably have never seen a crankshaft before, and there's one that's just rebuilt and under plastic. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but with airplanes, it isn't like cars. They, they run till they quit running. Don't they have to have something called an annual, which is like every 100 hours or something? They have to be fully inspected to make sure they're uh, airworthy. That's exactly right, and uh, aircraft engines are also uh, life-limited sometimes to uh, 2,000 hours of operation. Uh, here's a kid standing in front of an ocean of uh, aircraft cylinders. They're all air-cooled, of course to uh, save weight. There's some more uh, <coughs> cylinders right there. Um, here we are in my intro to aviation class uh, at Golden Wings Museum up at Anoka County Airport. Greg Herrick is the owner of Golden Wings. He's nice enough to let us use his facility. This hangar is one acre in size, uh, heated year-round, uh, also uh, temperature controlled, uh, humidity controlled, and uh, Mr. Herrick is known far and wide as uh, a collector of antique airplanes, and he allowed us to see his uh, antiques. There's a Ford trimotor. Uh, used to actually be uh, used for transportation service back then. Three radial piston engines powering this airplane. Uh, that particular airplane that the students are standing in front of, they got to view the inside of it, was actually flown by Charles Lindbergh, Minnesota's own Charles Lindbergh. All right. Here's a, a shot of the old American Wings Air Museum at Anoka County Airport. You can see the tower in the background. Uh, again, students getting a chance to see uh, uh, museum quality aircraft. Here's one of the docents of the museum, one of the volunteers at American Wings Air Museum, showing us uh, this uh, OV-10 Mohawk, I believe it is, a turboprop powered airplane. <laughs> I, I would not recommend sitting in the air intake while the aircraft is running, but of course this is a museum piece and it makes for a nice photo. Yes, it does. Um, this is back in my classroom during Intro to Aviation. Again, it's three weeks in the summer. A kid is willing to give up three weeks in the summertime to, uh, to see my class. I teach the class. Here's a World War II reenactor showing us uh, how people dressed during the war in flight on a B-17 bomber or a B-25 bomber. There's a kid in full regalia. In the background, you can see one of my hand-drawn wings with a center of gravity located on it for the center of lift, and I'm drawing on the board in the background. Uh, and here's the kid, of course, with the mask on. Uh, fairly uncomfortable costume, but kids should know that. You know, it, it, it brings history to life. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things about my class is uh, we, we try and approach aviation from a number of different uh, aspects. We, uh, we talk about aviation, we see films about aviation, I have some magazines and films I can demonstrate a little later. Here's a kid working on a paper model. Uh, he's working on an airplane, that particular model is, is on its back right now, he's putting on the air intake. Uh, I ran into this person, there's another a picture of a kid working on a model. 
uh, ran into this person at an air show at Oshkosh, Wisconsin, um, the uh, annual air venture. That's a pretty large show, too, as I understand. One of the premier shows in the country. It is. It is the world's largest air show, uh, airventure.org, if you want to uh, see more on it. And uh, I ran into this guy. He makes paper models, and uh, they're fairly affordable. Uh, they're only about 3 or $4 a piece. And uh, one of the things is the kids have to make a model, and they have to fly a little air show routine at the end of the class. This photo means a lot to me. Um, the gentleman pictured in the suit is Ken Wofford. Ken Wofford is an inductee into the Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame. Ken Wofford has 6,000 hours of flight experience in his logbook. But the thing about Ken Wofford that I want you and the viewership to know is he's an original Tuskegee Airman. Uh, black pilots did not have the right to fly for this country at the beginning of World War II. And uh, the Tuskegee experiment was actually set up to fail. It was set up to prove by some racist people in the military that black pilots could not fly as well as, as anyone else. But what happened was their plan backfired on them. Not only did they fly as well, as some say they flew even better. The gentleman Ken Wofford pictured there is an original Tuskegee Airman. Uh, he passed away in September of 2009. For 10 years, he spoke to my class, told his story of his actual flight experiences flying out of Italy, and uh, told of some discriminatory practices that existed back then. Uh, Ken Wofford did not accept a dime, not one dime, for his appearances over 10 summers in my class. Instead, he insisted that any money, any stipend, any honorarium that would go to him instead go to redtail.org. Uh, redtail.org is a, uh, a site where uh, they're trying to keep an actual P-51 that was actually flown by the Tuskegee Airmen in the air as a living memorial and a living educational tool. Their, their goal is to get into every class in America and tell the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. I love this photo. It's not perfectly focused, and that's not your fault. That's my fault. I'm the one that took this photo uh, because that really is the handshake of a lifetime. Uh, that kid, I hope, never forgets that handshake. Uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, truly American heroes. Here's a photo of uh, my class at Whip Air. Uh, Whip Air is the world's largest manufacturer of floats that go on airplanes. And if you look at the foreground of this photo, you can see an oar lying there. Uh, with every set of floats that you put on your airplanes, you also get an oar. So when your engine won't start <laughs> in the middle of the lake, you can row to shore. You mean you can't call AAA? You, the AAA <laughs> does not come out in the middle of the lake to tow your airplane to shore. And uh, if you look closely at this photo, also you'll see in the nose of that float, you'll see a wheel hanging out there. Uh, so these are amphibious floats. They can be flown onto land and land on a regular runway. And of course, they can if you put your wheels up land on water also. Uh, Whip Air being the largest uh, amphibious float manufacturer in the world, we are fortunate to have them right here at South St. Paul Airport at Fleming Field. And again, they are so kind to my class, they are not charging me for the privilege of having a tour uh, through their class. The gentleman could not have been more charming. There's no way he couldn't have been more knowledgeable. And he answered every question that we had. Uh, there's a set of floats parked outside. You can see the rubber bumpers on the tips of the floats so that when you run, inevitably, you run into the dock, you don't damage the float. Um, there's a turboprop aircraft, a fairly large one, on Whip Air floats. These were specifically designed for this airplane by Whip Air. They have their own engineering department, their own marketing department. There's a single-place airplane that has a turboprop engine on that big, long nose. And uh, kids in my intro to aviation class get to see that airplane. It's called a Fire Boss, and it's used strictly for putting out fires uh, possibly in northern Minnesota or anywhere in the world. And they uh, scoop down and, and scoop up water out of the lake and just keep right on going and put out the fire. Here is uh, the gentleman talking in front of a de Havilland Beaver, uh, no longer manufactured, but a tremendous, uh, tremendously popular and, and utilitarian airplane. Uh, kids get to see this stuff. It really is the trip of a lifetime. Here we are at BRS, Ballistic Recovery Systems. They're also based right here in Minnesota, in South St. Paul Airport. They make a parachute that's packed into that little tube. You can install it in your airplane, 
And then if absolutely everything goes wrong, you hit the panic button, a rocket shoots out, the parachute then shoots out, and you float to the ground. Here's a kid seated in the uh, cockpit of a Stinson L5. This is at the Commemorative Air Force in South St. Paul. Again, we are so blessed here in Minnesota to have a great aviation history and to have a, uh, a rich uh, aviation uh, resources available to us. Uh, right here in South St. Paul's, the Commemorative Air Force, that's an actual World War II airplane. I have personally flown that airplane to Nebraska already and back, and I've gone to various air shows in Duluth, uh, Flying Cloud, at uh, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, um, taking it to Wisconsin already. Um, just generally, again, try to, to memorialize the service uh, of World War II pilots who flew that actual airplane in combat. And of course, kids get to sit in the cockpit and get their picture taken. It makes for a great memory. Here's Doug Weiler. He's a uh, Delta, now Northwest, or sorry, a Northwest, now Delta uh, pilot. He has since retired. Uh, he spent 19,000 hours of his life flying for, uh, for passenger service, uh, flying professionally. Uh, if you take 24 hours times 365 days a year, the number comes out to 8,760. So he spent over two solid years of his lifetime flying professionally. Again, I say now he's retired. He lives in Hudson, Wisconsin. He was nice enough to come to my class. You see uh, the PowerPoint presentation on the projector in the background talking about what it's like to be an airline pilot. I try and present all forms of aviation to these kids or as much as I possibly can. Here we are again at the Golden Wings Museum. Again, a uh, tour photo. Again, there's a tri-motor flown by uh, Charles Lindbergh. You can see wings in the background of uh, this photo of my class. Uh, you see a, a diversity of class, both by uh, sex and by race. I don't care who shows up. Uh, matters not. We can use anybody in the air. Uh, but the main thing is you see happy kids enjoying aviation. The wings in the background are from airplanes that still need to get restored. Uh, Golden Wings is actually a living museum. They're actually in the uh, restoration process on a number of rare airplanes that you don't get to see anymore. Some of the airplanes they have up there uh, right here at Anoka County Airport in the Twin Cities are one of a kind. They're the only one in existence. There we are at the engine shop again, and there's an actual engine that is assembled, reassembled, and uh, there it is mounted on the airplane. Um, I think for safe flying it's important to know the systems of your airplane, not just turn the key and the propeller turns and off you go, but you actually get to see what, what makes the airplane run. How do I fly this safely? Glime Publications puts together a little blurb that anybody can get for free. It's the Learn to Fly brochure. And I always get a, a number of those copies. You can see my, the mess that is my classroom. Uh, Learning is messy, and there's a lot of things going on in there. I actually bring a propeller into the classroom. Um, I bring models into the classroom. I try and make uh, the learning as interesting as I can. Here's a gal uh, that uh, just graduated from high school, and while she was in high school, she got her pilot's license. Uh, you have to be 16 years old to solo, and you have to be 17 years old to get your pilot's license, and she did both of those things. And uh, she did it the hard way. She, she got summer earnings and um, decided to, to uh, make the commitment and devote some of her money to flying. Here's a uh, 1946 Piper J3 Piper Cub. It's a classic airplane. Uh, after World War II, Piper uh, was manufacturing uh, airplanes for the war. And afterwards, they just started making Piper Cups for the civilian market. And of course, after World War II, we had thousands, literally thousands of servicemen with pilot credentials and had no airplane. So Piper filled the void by manufacturing the Cub. 65 horsepower, hand-propped. There is no starter to this airplane. I have to stand outside the airplane and actually swing the propeller with my hands to get it to start. And uh, this is a happy young eagle. Um, Part of the class is not necessarily to get a Young Eagle's flight, but I do choose on my own to give kids a Young Eagle's flight because that's another part of the learning of the class. So I usually wait until the class is over. That way there's no uh, uh, conflict of interest or, or uh, uh, one-upsmanship by some kids who've gotten a flight and some who haven't. So I, I choose to uh, wait until the class is over. Kid loved that flight so much, he's giving it two thumbs up. One thumb up isn't good enough. Uh, this particular kid I know is uh, still involved in aviation. He did join the Civil Air Patrol. 
Uh, people ask me what they should do uh, after aviation class is over. And um, one of the beautiful things about my class is every kid gets a lifetime guarantee. I give them uh, and their parents my uh, email address, and they can contact me and uh, ask me any question they want to about aviation. What camp should I go to? What publication should I subscribe to? What website can I go to to learn more? Um, I've had kids after this class take on pilot training. I had one kid actually build himself a wind tunnel, and now he's built himself a, his second wind tunnel out of materials that he would go to Menards with, uh, or go to fetch from Menards, and he built himself a wind tunnel. He's putting little wings inside there and testing it out. Um, I think I'll finish on this slide right here, just because I like to finish that. I'm sure we have more slides available. Oh, well, thank, that was very interesting, John, and I want to applaud your effort for uh, working with young people, because I think it's really important in this day and age, uh, kids really need a direction. It isn't like in the old days where they went to work with dad and they did a lot of physical things. Now parents sit down and go to work to an office and sit at a computer, and students have no idea. So they have to somehow find their interests, aptitudes, and abilities, and kind of get a vocation.